thing. What about your hair? You know, leave it like All that? All right. Good morning. Uh, Welcome back to our homegrown lecture series in 2021. If you can believe that, we have uh, successfully done this program since uh, uh, has it been April, somewhere around April or May. Um, so on the screen is this quarter's flyer. Uh, we have, as you've noticed, we've switched from an every week talk to bi-weekly. And uh, starting out today, we're gonna have Paul Winsky uh, talk about pollinator gardens. Next week will be Shannon Dietz with soil testing. <coughs> so uh, all your questions on soil testing can be answered next week. Um, in February, uh, myself, Brandy Keller with Spring Garden Prep, and then Paul will um, continue that with Spring Vegetable Gardening. And then in March, uh, that's gonna be a really fun one, History of Cattle in Texas. And we'll finish uh, that quarter up with all about basil um, uh, that I'll be doing. So as a reminder, you can sign up for all of these uh, all at once when you go to register. And um, that way you don't have to do it uh, independent or separately. Uh, as a reminder also, this is um, this is a live event. This is a little bit different from the last couple that we have done. And so to the right, there is an option for a chat. Uh, you can ask a question, we'll answer, and then we'll go ahead and publish it. So um, without uh, any more delay, I'd like to introduce Paul Winsky, the uh, horticulture agent for Harris County, Texas A&M AgriLife Extension. Welcome, Paul. Okay, well, thank you, Brandy, and hello there, Harris County. Um, let me go ahead and get this started. So today, um, we are gonna talk about pollinator gardens. Uh, there's always a lot of interest in this topic. We get a lot of calls, we got a, little, a lot of emails. Uh, and so um, just to start it off, um, you know, in this, uh, this will give you an overview. Uh, we're not going to get into a lot of super details, um, but there will be some references towards the end that are uh, have a great deal of information. Um, so this is just to get you, get the wheels turning. You know, we've got some cool weather now. Maybe you're not gardening as much, and maybe you've thought about doing one of these. And uh, hopefully, this will get you started in the right direction. So pollinated gar gardens. What are pollinators? Um, they are animals in some cases. Sometimes the wind can act as a pollinator also, um, but we're going to be talking about animals in this case in the general sense, and, and they help plants reproduce. They help them to set fruit um, or set seeds, and what they do is they carry pollen from one flower to another, just like, uh, you know, you, you would probably see already in your garden the way when you have bees working the, the uh, flowers. Um, without this pollination, uh, most of the fruits and vegetables will not set uh, will not set fruit, um, which would not be a good thing. Uh, and there's reasons for that, uh, whether it's a, a lack of pollination or there's uh, some other structural issues that that occur. Um, but there are different flowers uh, that attract different pollinators. So we have to take this into account when we're developing uh, this pollinator garden. So uh, shape and size, color, the arrangement of the flowers, whether it's a, just a single flower or it's multiple florets like in a panicle, uh, and even fragrance comes into play uh, when attracting these pollinators. So quick uh, botany 101, um, in order to understand what pollinators doing or, or why we need them, we have to understand just a little bit of what pollination is. So uh, if we look at this, this cutaway of a flower, um, the stamen, which we see up top here, uh, consists of two parts. The stamen is the male part of the flower. Uh, we have the anther, which is where the pollen grains are housed and would open up and dehiss, and that's attached to a, uh, onto a filament. And then the pistil is the female part of the uh, flower, and it's made up of the stigma, the style, 
the ovary, and then the ovule, which will be fertilized. So what happens is um, we need to get that pollen grain onto the surface of the stigma. And the pollen grain has two nuclei. Um, one forms this tube, which is called the tube nucleus, which will travel the length of the stigma. And uh, hopefully you can see how it germinates uh, in this uh, uh, depiction. Uh, the stigma is usually uh, sticky or tacky, so the pollen grains can attach to it. Um, oh, I am sorry. Let me go back. Um, and then, uh, so that pollen grain attaches, uh, the tube nucleus starts to germinate, it travels down the length of the style, uh, enters the ovary, uh, and then enters into the ovule where the uh, actual gamete will be released in order to um, uh, form an embryo. So that's what, what occurs and that's what we need to happen. Now plants, uh, are, are unique and they will do, uh, you know, some plants are what we call protandrous, which means um, the pollen is mature before the stigma is ready to accept. Uh, or we have the opposite, uh, which we call protogenous, which means uh, the stigma is ready to accept before the uh, pollen is ready to, ha has matured. Uh, and this why this is the reason why we want to have uh, multiple sources of pollen. Uh, we want to have multiple plants because everything's going to be at, at different stages. Uh, so this allows those pollinators to get in, uh, work the flowers, uh, and and go ahead and and bring the the uh, the pollen grains uh, to the stigma when it's ready. So uh, in general, what we want to do is get those pollen grains onto the stigma so they can germinate and we can end up with a fertilized egg. All right, so our types of pollinators, uh, in general, we've got bats, we've got birds, we have animals, and we have insects. And animals are usually smaller rodents and things like that. But these are the four um, major categories of uh, pollinators. And one of the interesting things I came across is, is, is how we can draw these various species in uh, to the garden. Uh, so you can see this is just for bats, bees, beetles, birds, butterflies, and moths. So we, we ran out of bee words there. Um, but you can see um, how the color affects these, uh, how we can draw them in. Uh, it's interesting just looking at butterflies and moths. Um, you know, so butterflies prefer the bright uh, colored flowers, including red and purple. Uh, moths may be more pale and dull, red, pink, purple, or white. Um, but the flower types are, are somewhat similar. Um, butterflies like to have a, a spur, uh, which would be a type of petal where it could land sometimes on it. Um, moths don't necessarily need that with, with its tubular without a lip. Uh, so it's just interesting to see the different types of form, the flowers and the forms uh, and how color comes into this. Fragrance also comes in, uh, uh, the amount of uh, uh, pollen and nectar uh, will also affect it. You know, so if you want to bring bats in, you want to make sure that you've got flowers or plants in there that that, that flower is going to stay open uh, in the evening and it's closed during the day uh, in order for that pollen source to be there for them if they are in your area. Insect pollinators are probably the ones that we are most familiar with. Um, about 80% of all plant species are pollinated by insects. And how do we get those pollinators into the garden? Uh, it is by enticing them with food. Um, we just got through the holidays. If you wanna bring family and friends into the house, feed them. It's the same with the insects. Um, we wanna have plants in there that provide nectar and provide pollen. Nectar is a carbohydrate source. Pollen is a protein source. So the insects, just like we need carbohydrates and proteins, uh, same thing for the insects. So this is critical uh, in designing and developing your, 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 your garden to make sure you've got um, plants that will offer this throughout the entire growing season. So with our plan, um, the more plants um, that we have and the variation that we have, we want to be able to attract and sustain those pollinators. Uh, 
Um, so if we have a increased population or a large population of flowers as a source to bring them in, we are going to have a lot of diversity of pollinators in that garden. And the great thing about having these pollinators in there is, is you know, we, we talk about static gardens and dynamic gardens and, you know, the these watching being able to watch these pollinators work the flowers and and get in there and and do what they have to do it's 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 a it's just it brings another dimension uh into your garden so be aware of that as you're uh, developing your plans so how do we where do we want to establish this garden okay we want a sunny location um ideally we want at least six plus hours of full sun now can you have a pollinator garden in the shade? Absolutely. There's plants out there that you can use in the shade that you will bring them, you know, you can bring the, pollinate, uh, the pollinators in. But just remember, you know, insects are cold blooded uh, animals. And so, you know, when it's warm, when they're in the sun, they're more active and they're going to be busier uh, doing what they need to do within those flowers. So uh, just be aware of that. Um, so first thing, location, we want at least six plus hours uh, of full sun. Um, we talked about the nectar and the pollen, and so we want diversity um, with those sources. So we can provide um, nectar and pollen um, with trees, with shrubs, with perennials, and with annuals. And we want to make sure we have them throughout the season, and we want to make sure that they overlap. Um, you know, we don't want to just have a, a group come in at, that blooms from, uh, say, April through May, and then we don't have anything again that blooms until July through August. Um, we want that succession, and so it's, it's great um, where we garden that we can do that um, because we've got plenty of, peop uh, plenty of plant material to work with that will allow us uh, to, to, to lengthen that uh, flowering season. We want to plant in groups if possible. Now, this is going to depend on the size of the pollinator garden that you're going to establish. But if you can plant in a, at least a group of three, um, it, it just works so much better. Um, I've got uh, salvia indigo uh, spires, um, and I've got a group of three plants, and I've got bumblebees that are constantly working those plants in the spring and summer. And so it, it's just a, a larger target for them. Uh, it's easier for them to work those flowers. So if you can plant in groups, uh, a minimum of group, a group of three, um, but if you don't have that space, that's fine. Um, don't worry about it because uh, as long as you've got the diversity and, and, and the um, the sources available throughout the season, uh, you'll keep those pollinators there and happy. Uh, and the other thing is, you know, native plants are preferred. Um, if if you can if you can work natives in there, um, by all means do it um, because those pollinators, uh, you know, it, it's almost like a an inborn instinct that they have. Um, they they know where the pollen is. They recognize those flowers. Now, does that mean if you have natives or if you don't have any natives at all, uh, and you've got you know annuals and perennials that are uh, you know cultivars and things like that, are you going to have pollinators in there? Absolutely. Um, but it just helps with that diversity if you can work those natives in. Um, and there's plenty of sources of, of, of native plants that we can we can use here in our area. So they, those are the three things we want to make sure we're aware of. Diversity, planting in groups, and work in those native plants um, where you can. Now, the other thing you have to be aware of with these um, pollinator gardens is you want to have, uh, if possible, a larval host plant, which is something that, you know, we, we may overlook. Uh, and this is predominantly for the butterflies and the moths because, you know, they have that complete life cycle. They go through a complete metamorphosis. Well, those the females will only lay their eggs on certain species in order for the egg to hatch and then the, the larval or the larvae or the caterpillar to feed. Uh, and so the two examples I have here are the monarchs, which they're specifically on milkweed, and then the black swallowtail, they like plants in that parsley family. So um, this is something else. If, if you want to bring that stage, if you want to be able to see that stage from these pollinators in your garden, 
um, focus on some of the, that type of plant material. Uh, and there are a list of out, out there for the various butterflies and moths of what the, the larval um, host plants are. Um, and this is, it, it, it's quite helpful to know that. Um, just be aware, it, every year we get at least one question where somebody says, you know, my, mil my milkweed or, or this plant is being destroyed uh, by this caterpillar, do, do I need to get rid of it? And it's, it's absolutely, you know, once they send a picture, it's, it's something similar to this. And it's like, no, that's the source of food for that stage. Don't worry about it. The plant's going to rebound. It's, it's just, it needs that energy. It's a feeding machine in order to go from the larval stage uh, into the next stage where it pupates and goes through the, the chrysalis. So larval host plants is another thing to consider when you're uh, thinking about installing one of these gardens. Um, the other thing is moisture, all right? So um, these pollinators, they need water. So they do need some type of, of, of water source, whether it's a small pool or uh, mud puddles or bird baths, you know, something like this, which we see here where th there's some stones in there. They can uh, perch on that. They can drink their water, put their proboscis in there and, and, and feed. Um, and just be aware that, you know, like anything else in this area, we don't want to have standing water for too long. So we want to change it out so we don't have issues with mosquitoes uh, down the road. Shelter is also key. So, you know, it, things that we need, these pollinators also need. Um, depending on where you're going to lay out that garden or install that garden, um, you know, you want to sort of protect it from that prevailing winds because you don't want these guys having to work too much or too hard uh, in order to uh, stay in that area. So things like trees and larger shrubs, um, areas in, within corners of the fences or, or even near the buildings where it's going to protect it, uh, it's going to be helpful uh, in order to um, help these pollinators uh, do their work. Uh, but just also be aware, you know, um, uh, that bumblebees and there's other solitary bees, they, they nest in the ground. Um, so they are looking for an area where they can burrow in and nest. Um, and this is where maybe you've got a patch of your garden where you don't mulch it um, and you've got the, the bare soil exposed. So these bumblebees and other solitary bees can go ahead and get in there and, and develop their uh, little nest and um, have a place to, to stay. Um, I, I like this image of this picture, this box that was made because there's, there's different um, items in there that provide uh, different types of protection. Uh, you can see they've got rocks, they've got um, pine cones, uh, they've got the bamboos. So uh, I thought this was a really interesting way to provide some shelter uh, for these pollinators and I'm sure the garden is right there nearby uh, so they can go work the flowers and then at night, come back um, and, and have a place to shelter. So um, be aware of that as you're uh, developing your plans. Pesticide use is, is always a question that comes up. Um, and the best thing is to reduce your application and use as much as possible. Now, does this mean that, um, you know, that you can get away from using them 100%? Um, there's a good, there's a very good chance, maybe not early on, but as that garden establishes and matures, because think about it this way. If we've got a nice diversity of plant material and we've got pollen sources and we've got nectar sources and we're bringing in these pollinators, we're also going to be bringing in beneficial insects because beneficial insects are going to either, they're, they're looking for prey, but they're also looking for sources of, of pollen and nectar. So as that uh, garden matures. Um, there's a, there's a very good chance that you're gonna you're gonna the amount of spraying that you're gonna have to do is gonna be very little. Um, and even if it's a soap or an organic type spray, it is still considered you know it, it's still considered a pesticide, and it works on contact. So that means that if there's a beneficial or a pollinator in the area, uh, and it gets hit with it. Um, you know, it could still negatively affect it, even though it's organic. So some people always, they think it's organic, it's not going to affect um, even the beneficials or the pollinators, but it will if, if there's, 
if they've been coded enough. So just be aware that you can dramatically reduce your reliance on the pesticides by having this nice diverse garden in place um, because we're bringing in not only the pollinators but the beneficial insects. All right, so to wrap up, when we're establishing and planting, um, these habitats can come in all shapes and sizes. Um, you want to maintain, just like when we talk about earth kind gardening, good gardening practices. Um, when you plant, make sure you space them properly so they don't get, you know, grow on top of each other too, too quickly. Um, make sure you're planting properly. Make sure you, you're irrigating um, to get them started and, and as they need it. Um, mulching, again, I mentioned that as uh, in that main garden, but make sure you have areas if, if you've got bumblebees that they can turn around and um, establish their nest. And so they're not going to go burrowing, burrowing through the uh, mulch. Um, they like to go right into the soil. So have an area where um, they could possibly establish. We want that blooming throughout the season um, and we want to overlap. Uh, this will ensure that we've always got some food source available for these um, pollinators. And then the other thing is, you know, we want to plant in drifts if possible. You know, if we've got a small area, um, you know, just getting the, a nice right mix, a nice mix of plant material in there will be fine. But if you've got the space, if you can put three of, of uh, uh, echinacea or three of this or three of that, um, it's going to work much better because uh, they will come in and, and work those plants um, rather nicely. Okay, so where we are at now is you get to do a little bit of work. Um, so if there are any questions, so first thing I want to do is I want to know what is your favorite pollinator plant? What is your go-to pollinator plant? Um, and you can, I've done this before, so if you text, um, if you put my name, Paul Winsky 227 and you text it to 37607, you will get a notice back saying that you can then post. And I, I just want to get an idea to see what plants uh, everyone uh, likes as their pollinator plants. Um, I, we all have our favorites, and so I'm just curious to see um, which ones you, you've you worked with in the past, which ones perform well, uh, and, and get an idea like that. So let's see, uh, give us some time. I guess quickly, Shannon or Brandy, are there any questions posted that um, I need to answer, or is everything good on your end? Um, there's uh, there are a couple. Uh, one came in at the beginning, said I planted a Texas AgriLife pollinator garden in September. It's doing great. I do have a lot of blue field matter growing in it. Should I weed it out or leave it? Uh, at this time, uh, that's a great question because one of the things um, I would say, especially through the, the fall and winter, leave some of that debris in there because it allows it, it provides some protection for these um, pollinators. Um, here we go. We've got one coming in zinnias. Excellent. Very good choice. So yes, some debris, even a few weeds here and there are going to be um, uh, are going to be a plus um, because it adds a little bit of diversity. It adds some protection. Uh, and so uh, yeah, it, it doesn't have to be highly manicured um, and and having some debris in there is going to be good. Now in the spring of the year you can go ahead and clean it up because uh, over time um, you know you want that fresh growth to come through. Uh, if there's any chance of uh, any disease issues uh, you can get that uh, out of there. So great question. All right so we've got a lot of uh, folks in here. Fennel great Great, great uh, plant, aster, borage, milkweed. Um, some of the other ones, sunflowers, great. Uh, the thing I like about sunflowers is you can also, uh, they're a great trap crop uh, for leaf footed bugs. Um, so you can passively um, go out there once the uh, leaf footed bugs are on there uh, and then just turn around and knock them into a, a bucket of soapy water and you've got them. So 
Miss flower, great. Awesome, so a lot of the plants um, that we're gonna talk about, you guys are already seeing. Lavender, great. All right, so let me move on. Uh, thank you for uh, participating. Uh, I am going to lock that now and we can move on to the next slide. Great, I uh, hope I woke everybody up and I've got you all uh, ready to go here. Let's see. I'm not moving. Let's see, unlock this. All right, hold on a second. We've got a little malfunction here. Here we go. Oh. Okay, so let's talk about some of the uh, the plants um, that we can use as pollinators. And I'm, I'm gonna touch on a few annuals, a few perennials, some shrubs, uh, even a few trees. And, you know, j just as a, uh, uh, a caveat here, this is not all inclusive. Uh, these are ones that I've seen in my 30 plus years in the industry um, that work extremely well. Some of these I've got in my garden or I've had in my garden in the past. So um, this is just to give you an idea. And as I mentioned, at the end, uh, there will be a list of uh, four resources um, and I'll touch on those and, and there's uh, both of the uh, most of those have very good um, uh, list of plants that you can use. So let's look. Um, annuals, pentas, uh, great for summer blooming. So through the heat of the summer, um, provides pollen, provides nectar, um, nice color range. Uh, the other thing is we've got a lot of different uh, sizes. So depending on the garden that you've got, where you need it. Uh, there are taller varieties that can get up to two feet, and we've got shorter varieties that are about, uh, you know, eight inches, eight to ten inches tall. So we can use them at different parts and different areas of the uh, garden. Sunflowers, someone mentioned, uh, again, great pollen source, great way to use as a trap crop. Uh, and the other thing again here is we can have dwarf varieties and we, ha we can have varieties that are, you know, six to eight feet tall. So uh, depending on what you, what you have to work with, where you want to use it, um, and who, who doesn't love one of those, uh, a, a huge sunflower um, when it's in bloom and that, you know, bright, bold uh, yellow color. And then the last of the annuals that I have is our zinnias, and someone mentioned that. So. Um, Again, lots of diversity, um, larger flowered ones, cut flower types, uh, small compact ones. The thing I like about these smaller ones um, is they, I like the term, they bury their dead. Uh, the older flowers just sort of um, get lost as the, the plant grows up over it. You don't have to deadhead, which is kind of nice. It's one less thing you have to worry about. Um, and they just provide a nice pollen source throughout the spring and in through the summer uh, and even into early fall. So uh, zinnias are, are, are great for, for working into that pollinator garden. Now let's look at some of the uh, perennials, echinacea. Uh, you can see uh, great pollen source. It, it's anything that has that composite you know, from the composite family uh, that has that daisy-like look um, is going to be a good source of pollen um, to bring these pollinators in. And purple coneflower now, echinacea, purpurea, um, there are other colors out there, um, but if you can find the native varieties or the, the native ones, um, you know, again, always try and work in a few of those natives. If you want a completely native, um, they are out there uh, and you want to take advantage of that. Black Eyed Susan, Rudbeckia, um, you can see the trend with the, 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 the type of flower. Uh, the thing I like about the perennials are uh, as they mature, they fill in, uh, coming back year from year, so a little less um, 
uh, work. You know, you clean them up at the end of the season or beginning of the season, I should say, because we want to leave some of that debris behind. But overall, these uh, will provide plenty of color and uh, great food sources. Uh, here's the milkweed. So this is this one is Asclepias tuberosa. Um, but there are plenty of species, native species, uh, that are out there uh, for Texas. Uh, so I would definitely say, and this is one of the, if you want to bring, uh, this is, would be a larval plant um, for the monarch. So uh, any of the milkweeds, um, that's going to be their source for the females to come in to lay their eggs and then for those eggs to hatch and for the larvae to feed in order to go into their, their next stage before they go into a chrysalis. Agara, uh, Linheimeri, uh, whirling butterflies is one of the varieties out there. This is one of those wispy perennials, probably about 18 to 24 inches tall. Um, flowers are usually white, pink, or pink. Um, and you can see they, they just add a nice look uh, to the garden. Uh, if you get some breezes, they just sort of... Uh, you know, sway with the with the breeze, and so it, it keeps that uh, landscape in a uh, more of a dynamic look, as opposed to just being upright and and set all the time. Uh, someone mentioned salvias, and there are more salvias out there than you can uh, shake a stick at, uh, and they all do. They all are work great in pollinator gardens. This is Lucantha, uh, so this is the Mexican bush sage. Uh, and you can see how those uh, flowers are up on those spikes. Uh, they present themselves real well, nicely uh, to the pollinators. The other thing I like about this plant is um, when we talked about shelter and protection, you can see once that plant establishes, uh, it is going to provide a lot of um, uh, a, a very good space for them to to get down in there if for something if for some reason they need that protection uh, whether it's out of the full sun for a while or just protection from that wind um, they can get down inside that plant uh, and protect themselves copper canyon daisy tajides limonii is a great uh, native um, low growing. So this is one that, you know, you're going to want in the front of the bed. Nice yellow flower, but again, it's got that little daisy flower look. Um, the foliage has a fragrance to it, uh, so it brings in a lot of pollinators uh, and it, it, it allows you to, you know, to build that bed. You know, you can have the low growing plants, you can have your mid-size and then your larger material um, back towards the end. Um, White mist flower, Eupatorium. Uh, now this is going to be a late summer into fall bloomer. So uh, we, when we talk about ex extending that uh, flowering range, this is one that you want to have for late fall or, or late spring into fall. Uh, it's a much. It's going to be a larger plant, um, probably about three, three and a half, maybe even four feet tall, depending on the age. But it is just covered with these white blooms, uh, and it looks like a white cloud. And as you can see in the image above, um, you know we've got some uh, butterflies there working the flowers. So, um, great source, uh, a, a great perennial to to have in there um, to bring in those pollinators. Turk's cap is another one. Um, it, it, it's easy for the, uh, the pollen is, is, is available, but then there's also nectar down in there. So, you know, we can bring in the birds and we can bring in the, poll you know, the, the uh, beneficial insects and things like that. Uh, Turk's cap will get large, works well in the sun or the shade. Um, predominantly red, but there are pink, pink varieties out there. Um, but this will probably get about five to six feet tall. So it, it almost borders on, it. is it a perennial? Is it a shrub? It really just depends uh, how you prune it, how you manage it, um, but a great plant to have in, uh, in your pollinator garden. Um, let's talk about a couple vines. You know, we, we, we need some vines in there. We, there's some vines that are great plants uh, for the uh, pollinators. So uh, Gelsimium, uh, Carolina jessamine is great. It's evergreen. So uh, even when it's it's not in bloom, you've got some color in the in the uh, in the garden during uh, especially this time of year. It's got the glossy foliage, but it's these bright yellow fragrant flowers uh, that bloom and it blooms very early in the spring. So there's a good chance, depending on how cold we get, 
you know, sometimes end of February, this starts to bloom, sometimes mid-February, sometimes early March. So it really just depends. Um, but you know, spring is just around the corner when you can smell this with the uh, gelsimium uh, in bloom. Um, then we have cross vine. So this is bignonia. Uh, so this is a semi evergreen or evergreen. It's a climbing vine uh, and it's I, we call it semi evergreen because if we do happen to get a a cold winter um, where we're below freezing for, you know, uh, maybe uh, several days, multiple days, there's a chance it, that it will drop its foliage, which is fine. Um, it, it's not going to hurt it. Um, but you can see it, it produces these clusters of uh, yellowish red tubular flowers. Uh, and so, you know, it's going to attract certain types of pollinators uh, and does extremely well in the sun to depart shade. So cross vine or bignonia is great for the spring. Um, and then when we talk about that succession, the trumpet vine or campsis has a similar type flower, but it's a summer bloomer. So uh, again, making sure we have overlap, making sure that we've got pollen and nectar there uh, throughout the season. Uh, campsis is deciduous, so it will drop its foliage, where bignonia we, we said is evergreen or semi evergreen. This one is strictly deciduous, so uh, and it does well uh, in the full sun. Um, this is one I, I, I really like, Aloysia vergata, um, almond, sweet almond verbena. Um, it's a large woody shrub by itself. Um, it's, it's not real pretty. So this is a plant that you want to put towards the back of the, of the bed or the garden uh, and let it grow up through uh, the plants that are in front of it. And then these flowers uh, will sort of just hang down and, and drip down. And, and the fragrance on this is, is, is very sweet, really nice, and it blooms the entire summer. Um, so, and you can see these clusters, uh, you know, it, it allows them to, they're, they're very small tubular flowers. So uh, the beneficials and the pollinators can come in and, and work that pollen. Uh, there's nectar in there. Uh, and throughout the entire summer, this thing will be in bloom. Uh, so again, put it towards the back, have some other uh, mid-sized plants growing up to, to cover the base of it. Uh, but then when this blooms, uh, you'll enjoy it not only for the fragrance, but the pollinators are going to enjoy it also. Uh, Abelia is a great shrub, uh, produces these clusters of, of small tubular flowers, um, does well in our heat and our, in our humidity, um, has a slight fragrance to it. And these will bloom, you know, in the spring through mid to early summer, uh, depending on how hot we get and how quickly we get. Uh, you know, the heat sets in, uh, but it's a, a great evergreen shrub. Um, and again, another source of protection and shelter, <coughs> excuse me, for these pollinators also. <coughs> uh, Vitex is one that it, it's a, uh, a native, it's deciduous, um, it produces these large spikes, purple flowers. There's pink varieties out there. Um, there are some varieties that are, are getting more compact in their growth habit, but in general, it's, it's going to top out at about uh, 15 feet tops. Um, butterflies love this and the moths love it. Um, they, they just will work this uh, when it is in bloom. Uh, now it is a spring bloomer, but if, if, you, if you are managing the height of this, um, after it blooms, you could go ahead, you can uh, remove or cut prune out the spent blooms and it will get another flush so you could have multiple um, flower production uh, cycles with this plant if you want to prune it if you don't it'll bloom once uh, and when it's in bloom it's uh, that that purple color just really pops um, but i really like this and once it's established it, it's it's very hardy and drought tolerant um, small trees large shrubs you know, depending on your definition, um, Ilex decidua, the possum hall holly. And, you know, this is the time of year that we would see the berries on this plant. Uh, so, you know, in the spring, we, you know, it, it, it flowers very inconspicuous, but it is a pollen source uh, for, for these pollinators. Uh, and it's a nice, tidy tree. Um, you can see 
tops out at about 12, maybe 15 feet. Uh, maybe a, a wide will probably, the width of it will probably get about um, maybe 15 to 20. It's going to get probably a little bit wider than it will taller. Um, but again, especially this time of year, it's excellent winter color. So you've got interest out there and the birds will come and, and, and feed on those berries uh, throughout the uh, winter. Um, Calicopra Americana, American Beauty Berry is a great shot. I just, I, I love this in the, in the fall. Um, it produces these uh, clusters of uh, these small, you know, light lilac flowers in the summer. Um, most people probably don't even recognize this plant um, when it's in bloom because it's very inconspicuous, those blooms. But once those um, flowers are pollinated, uh, and we see that fruit uh, in the fall, uh, you can't miss this plant. Uh, those clusters of those uh, purple berries along the stem uh, just really sets it off and um, jumps out at you. And then it, again, you've got a, a, a food source for the birds um, once you have those berries. Uh, one of the other small trees that I really enjoy uh, here is, is uh, Circus canadensis, the red bud. This is a deciduous tree, blooms early in the spring, so your gelsimium would probably bloom first, and then your red bud isn't going to be far behind, uh, and it blooms first and then leaves out second. So this is a, this tree in bloom. It's got these lavender, blink, uh, lavender pink blossoms. Uh, and then uh, once the blooming uh, ends, um, it'll put out heart shaped um, foliage. So it's a it's a nice tidy tree um, that will provide some uh, shelter uh, for these pollinators throughout the uh, heat of the summer. And then, uh, you know, last but not least, you know, the southern magnolia. This is a plant that the beetles like to um, pollinate and get into uh, as a pollen source. Uh, so uh, evergreen, you know, and, and we, we see these in the landscape. They, they've got that nice dark underside uh, of that foliage, which adds a nice contrast. It's a great shelter for these pollinators because of that very thick uh, foliage. Um, uh, and they can get on the underside and, and protect themselves. So this is one, you know, in the landscape, you're it's probably going to be more of a specimen tree by itself, but it will provide, you know, pollen uh, and it will provide shelter uh, for these beneficials. So that is uh, just a few of the plants. Uh, like I said, this, this, um, the list of plants that you can use um, for your pollinator garden is, is pretty much endless. Um, some of the resources that I want to touch on, uh, this first one, pollinator pa partnership. Um, which is at uh, pollinator.org. Um, they have some really good information. There's research papers that are there. Um, they even have these um, booklets that you can put in your zip code and it will download a uh, booklet for our region. And our region, believe it or not, according to their, um, their list is we are part of the Prairie Parkland subtropical region. Uh, it is really interesting how they've broken up the uh, United States uh, in order to uh, give you the information that you need um, for developing your pollinator garden. So uh, this is one, one, one resource that I would highly recommend. Of course, we've got the Lady Bird Johnson Wild, Wildflower Center. They've got a section just on pollinator conservation and they have uh, a great list of plants. You can filter by what you're looking for, whether it's annuals uh, or, or perennials or shrubs or trees. Um, uh, great resources. Um, that Native Plant Society, the Houston chapter, they've got some really good PDFs uh, that you can download. Uh, and they'll, they'll have, you know, if you want to focus just on um, uh, lar larval plants for the various moths and butterflies, they've got just a list of, of plants and it and it tells you which which um, uh, you know larval stage, uh, what type of butterfly or moth uh, that will use that plant. And then the last one is a, just a nice quick brochure that Native Pollinator Plants of South Texas. Um, 
it's got a list of probably about a dozen or so plants and it's got uh, the regions within the state of Texas, South Texas, where they will uh, perform well. So um, with that being said, um, I hope you found this useful. Um, this has been recorded, so uh, you will receive uh, from us a, a link to this on our uh, YouTube channel. Uh, you will also be receiving a survey. We like to hear back from you uh, as to how we are doing with these uh, programs. Uh, and I guess uh, I'll open it up, uh, Shannon or Brandy. Do, are there any questions that need to be um, answered? Oh. Oh. Yes, sir. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. OK. Yeah, so just wanted to kind of, um, so there was two questions that came across that uh, just wanted to kind of discuss with you to see what your thoughts on on. And, you know, whenever you were talking about the, the pollinator houses or the bee houses mm -hmm. um, back in one of the screens, I thought that was a really cool idea. But somebody was asking about the fact that, you know, and it's a very good point that they made, is that, um, you know, unfortunately, not only do our pollinators like to find habitat in those areas, but unfortunately wasps um, like to take up habitat in those areas as well. And um, obviously those can be pretty dangerous. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I tried, um, I was, you know, having a discussion with one of the, the participants and, um, you know, especially if you're allergic, you know, or right. uh, the stings can be very uh, dangerous. Some can sting more than once, different things like that. But anyway, uh, they asked the question, is there a style of material that wasps like less? And I don't really know, um, is there, and I don't even, you know, in addressing that, you know, you just have to be careful. Um, because they do tend to make like more of a paper nest. Um, mm -hmm. And so like in those bee houses, if you don't provide a lot of room, maybe, you know, if you fill it with a lot of structures yeah, yeah. that you were talking about in there, that doesn't maybe give them a lot of space. But, um, you know, you usually see like wasp nests under the eaves or, right. Uh, right. you know, different things like that. So um, that's just something maybe you want to address or maybe maybe we can talk about it real quick um i, I don't know your thoughts on that um yeah that, that, that that's a great great question um i am not aware of of an answer to that um yeah. uh, i would probably you know that might be when you check out the you know the native plant society uh the houston chapter um that might be a good question or they may have inf other information uh, yeah. on there regarding you know how do you we want to bring those pollinators in we want to provide them shelter but how do we keep mm -hmm. um you know some of the other ones that could cause us some harm that, that, right. that could be a little bit more aggressive um and and so uh that's a great question but i honestly i do not have an yeah, answer to that right now yeah. Um, yeah yeah and you don't want to use like poisons or anything right exactly. Um, exactly so it's kind of a catch you know 20 you know um but anyway and so somebody else also asked a question and maybe you can help provide some um direction on this uh more deer resistant pollinator plants i know there's not a lot of them out there because deer tend to eat pretty much everything um especially in the winter months um and so I don't know if there was some more uh, information you wanted to provide if you knew of other deer resistant. Not, you know, not that I'm aware of, but there's a good possibility that um, if you go to that Lady Bird Johnson site and you look at, you know, because I, I think you, you might, if you can't cross reference both pollinators and deer resistance, you might be able to first look up deer resistant plants and then take that list and see if how many of those plants come up in the pollinator list also um, and that might be able to help you narrow down you know that the potential list of plants that will um, 
um, you know, yeah. do both, uh, be okay. resistant to the deer, but also help the pollinators. Yeah, yeah be, being in an urban county, uh, you know, and I know people have, you know, uh, ranches and things like that, but, you know, we, we don't deal, deal with the deer as much yeah. here in an urban yeah. county as, say, if you've got land someplace else outside of Harris County or, or whatever that you, you've got that issue. Yeah, I agree. All right, I'm going to pipe in real quick because we just have too many questions then we're going to be able to answer, but I want to go back real quick to the Beauty House. Um, there's definitely other resources, but as Shannon mentioned, it's it, it is an advantage to um, use smaller holes that they, um, you know, wasp wouldn't be able to enter into. But it, we also have to recognize that those may be more for like honeybees and native bees do not, they simply do not nest like that. Native bees that are being decimated by other practices like mulching, um, they they nest in the ground. So even just to have a population of uh, native bees to just be aware, maybe don't mulch your whole bed or have a back of your yard where you know you have open grass or in general just don't freak completely out when you see bees in the ground because that's usually like, oh my God, there's ground bees. Well, that's really a congratulations usually. Um, I know depending on who you have in the yard, it might not be, but um, but there's just way too many questions for us to answer here, but there were a couple that I specifically told them that I was going to ask you about. So let me go back and um, so are any of these good for a very shady garden? Um, they they will work well, um, but the, the, the one issue is that the um, flower production won't be as um, I'd say proliferous. Uh, they won't be as prolific um, if they're in a heavy, heavily shaded garden. And again, I would look back on um, at the uh, uh, the wild. Um, uh, what was that source? I'm sorry. Um, the Native Plant Society. They will have natives that they list uh, for the shade that will probably that will also work well for pollinators. So, um, you know, check out some of those sites because they will be able to, uh, you know, go into it uh, with a little bit more detail. OK, and uh, my Turks cap is gangly. When do I prune? Uh, I would wait uh, until um, I would wait until the end of February just beginning or beginning of March, you know, it, we, there's a chance we can still get a freeze. Just, just leave it there. Um, you know, that gangly growth will take the hit with the frost if we get it. Uh, and then um, you'll be able to clean it up uh, early spring. Okay. And do you want to take um, a couple more or how are you feeling right now? We got, let, let's go till 11. So we've got eight minutes. So let's see um, what we can work through. Okay, is it good to prune oak leaf uh, hydrangeas? Uh, yes, um, you know, you're going to want to, again, it, it depends on the, the look you want, how large you want it to be. Um, but I, you know, I, I don't have an issue with coming through and, and cleaning that up because you get that fresh new growth. Um, when you prune, there's a chance that you've got more buds, so you're going to have um, more shoots with potential uh, flower buds on them so you can increase that flower production on that plant. So yes, I would uh, definitely recommend pruning it. Okay, and uh, the the talk has definitely, um, there's been, I will tell you, there's been a lot of comments um, uh, just of appreciation on the presentation. So uh, you have many, many thanks, Paul. Good. Um, oh, this was the other one um, I thought was interesting. Does Possum Hall only produce berries during a certain season or all year long? Oh, it's, it's definitely going to be uh, in the winter. Um, so, you know, it's Ilex deciduous, so it's one of the few hollies that is deciduous. It's not an evergreen. So um, once that it drops that foliage, that's when you really, you know, the berries are there and then they color up uh, and then you just see that tree with, with just that berry set on it. And in the wild, you'll see some yellow versions of it. So you, you might be driving down a country road and you might see, you know, you might see some red 
uh, ones, but you can also find some yellow ones, which are also very eye catching. When you're going 55 and you see it in the field, uh, it will uh, grab your attention. So make sure you pay attention to the road. <laughs> All right, and then um, one person said that they have a fake hornet nest in the middle of their wildlife garden. So that's a, um, I guess that works for them. That sounds really mm. cute. Okay. Um, and then, uh, can you control red wasps and not hurt others? Um, so I'll just make a comment, and then you both of you can chime in. So I think w when it comes to red wasps, it's probably best to find out where where they're going and. There's, there's sprays to be used um, directly on them. I mean, so it's not like you would just spray them while they're out and about, you know, if they're if they're trying to, um, you know, find a home, you know, up under, your, you know, somewhere like in your, uh, by your house, you know, find out where they're coming from. Uh, Shannon, do you have another recommendation? <clears throat> no. Uh, I mean, you know, some of these insects, they're just, they're just unpredictable. I mean, you just can't, um, you know, really control where they're going to go. I mean, uh, you know, I mean, look at this, the airspace around us. I mean, it, it's, uh, you know, um, I would say, you know, just always be careful. If you see a wasp nest, uh, be extremely careful. Um, uh, if you have to take a wasp nest out, you know, um, you know, there are sprays that have a very long reach on them, um, that you don't have to get anywhere like in proximity to it. Um, you know, um, it, but other than that, um, uh, just be extremely, extremely careful around, um, because you never know what type of wasp it is. Um, it could be a mud dobbler. It could be, you know, um, something that won't harm you, and it could be something that harms you. So unless you know exactly what it is, um, just err on the side of of caution. And um, you know, Paul, I mean, yeah, I, 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 I sort of like what what Brandy had said is is, uh, and you know, we we could always check with the our entomologist, but um, you know finding out where it is that they're going uh, and, and taking care of them in that situation is is uh, probably your best bet. All right, and uh, let's see. So which of these, poly okay, I, I'm not sure if you'll have an answer for this, but um, this always comes up. Which of the pollinator plants might be considered deer resistant? Okay, and, and I think that's where we I- We talked about that one already. Yeah, we oh, talked we did? about that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. I'm reading from this and I don't know if there's any more. Um, yeah, one said there may be pollinator, pollinator plants that wasps like to avoid. Um, that's very curious. I'm, I, I'm not, nothing comes to the top of my mind, but I'm sure. Um, I do know bottle brush likes wasps <laughs> because, you know, I get a lot of pollinators, including the, the wasps, but they don't bother me. So I just let them be, but I do keep my distance. Um, it looks like, Shannon, unless you see anything else, uh, I don't really see um, anything else. So, so Paul, um, thank you very much. This was, uh, this was a really fun presentation. And um, do red wasps have any positive role in the garden? Yes, they're pollinators. So, um, that's, that's where I see my, um, that was a question that just came in. Mm -hmm. That's where I see my um, see them on my bottle brush. So they are all types of wasp. Most wasps are are some kind of not most, but some wasps are pollinators. So they definitely aren't all bad. Um, I'm not a fan of the red wasp, so I I hear what everybody's saying. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, Paul. And we're going to go ahead and end it here. 
and uh, join us next week when Shannon talks about uh, soil testing, which is two weeks. Next week. two, weeks. two weeks. Yes, two weeks. we are going every two weeks now. Right. Every <laughs> we have other to keep week. Me, yep. Keep me on. Um, but we always get a lot of questions um, about soil testing, how to do it, when to do it, um, where it goes, and then how to interpret um, the answers when uh, you get it back. So if you haven't signed up for that, uh, go ahead and do that, and we will see you back in two weeks. All Thanks, right. Paul. Thank you all. Have a great day.